Well, please remain standing for the reading of God's Word, Proverbs 14, Proverbs 14, beginning at verse 15 through to verse 24. Proverbs 14, verse 15 through to verse 24, and we'll find that on page 537 in the Pew Bible. This is the Word of God. The simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his steps. One who is wise is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is reckless and careless. A man of quick temper acts foolishly, and a man of evil devices is hated. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. The evil bow down before the good and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. The poor is disliked even by his neighbor, but the rich has many friends. Whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. Do they not go astray who devise evil? Those who devise good meet steadfast love and faithfulness. In all toil there is profit, but mere talk tends only to poverty The crown of the wise is their wealth, but the folly of fools brings folly. Thanks be to God for his word. Let's pray. We ask now, Lord God, that your spirit will speak to us faithful words from my mouth, that we'll be instructed, almighty God, by your word. Show us what it means to be a child of God in a dark world. Make us distinct from that world, almighty God. Sanctify us by your word, which is truth. May your spirit work in our midst now, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, in Pastor Ocken's series from 1 John, he's been dealing with foundational matters of the Christian life foundational matters of Christian living. Uh, Some of those matters have spoken to us what it means to be a child of God, distinguishing features and factors of the Christian, distinguished as they are from the world. He who loves God and loves the brethren is a child of God. He who abides in Christ, in God, is a child of God. He who has the spirit that confesses Christ is God, is of Christ. While negatively, John has stated, hating the brethren, denying the Christ, those are our characteristics of those who belong to the world, markers which reveal the identity either of a child of God or a child of the world. Scripture is full of such markers, of such distinguishing factors. They reveal the identity of God's people or the people of the world, often speaking of their character and their conduct. Their character and their conduct. Proverbs is no different. Set in a slightly different context to that of 1 John, using slightly different language, but with essentially the same message. Proverbs, you see, calls us to be categorically different from the world. You, me, we are called by Proverbs to be categorically different to the world. And that's difficult, and it's increasingly difficult because the world seeks more and more to get us to conform to its standards, its norms, its requirements. This passage before us speaks to us both of character and of conduct. What is expected, what is visible in the child of God, and what is expected and visible in those of the world. Uh, To be or not to be, what is our character? And to do or not to do, what is our conduct? That's the outline of this passage today. Verses 15 to 18 speak to us principally of conduct. Uh, Verses 18 then to verse 24 also speak to us, uh, sorry, verse 15 to 18 speak to us of character, beg your pardon, character. 
18 to 24 speak to us about conduct, character and conduct descriptive of the child of God and the one who is found in the world. So look first of all then at 15 to 18, uh, what I've entitled to be or not to be. What is Christian character like? What is the character of the world that we observe around us? This section of Proverbs, in terms of its structure and so on, is really, really interesting. At least it is for me. Uh, You'll be wondering perhaps why verse 15 is being preached on this week when we preached it last week as the last verse of the prior section. Perhaps you can remember we looked at verses 8 to 15 last week. 8 and 15 being the bookends of that section, uh, united together by theme, discerning one's ways, discerning one's steps, verse 8 and verse 15. Uh, United also by language, the prudent found in verse 8, the prudent found in verse 15. But then verse 15 is also replicated in theme and language in verse 18, the end of our first section tonight. Verses 15 to 18 deal with character. Notice there is also a connection in Theme and language again between these verses. Verse 15, the simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his steps. Verse 18, the simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with glory. You can see very clearly there's a thematic connection as well as a linguistic connection. Interestingly enough, verse 18 does the same thing. It forms part of that section, 15 to 18. It's also the first verse of another section, verses 18 to 24, which deals with conduct. The connection being this, theme and language. Verse 18, the simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. Verse 24, the crown of the wise is their wealth, but the folly of fools brings folly. What does the fool and the wise man inherit, in other words? They're crowned. That's the connecting language. And so we've got some very interesting structures going on here in Proverbs, which help us to discern the central teaching of these passages. And the central teaching of 15 to 18 is about character. Character. Notice verse 16, one who is wise. That is what that person is. A fool is reckless. By and large, 15 to 18 describes the character of the child of God, the wise man, or the character of the fool, the unbeliever. So we ask ourselves the question, what are we like? Or perhaps we could ask the question, what are we to be like? And Proverbs provides a positive picture that we are to aspire to and a negative picture that we are to flee from. Look firstly at the fool of these verses, the unwise of these verses, 15 to 18. We're reminded in, in wisdom literature, uh, in, in Scripture, the fool uh, really covers a, a broad spectrum of kinds of people. Uh, at the harsh end of folly is Psalm 14, the fool says, in his heart there is no God. We're talking about rank God deniers, in other words. But we also see in Proverbs that the fool is described in very different ways. Scoffers, mockers, the simple who are ignorant, the angry, the evil, the devious, and so on. But a base description of the fool is this. He despises instruction, 1-7, and he says in his heart, there is no God. An unteachable person who conducts himself according to his own Understanding here in 15 to 18, the fool is described in four different ways. Verse 15, he's simple. Verse 16, he is a fool. Verse 17, he's a man of quick temper and evil devices. And again in verse 18, he is simple. 15 and 18 being the bookends of this short section. The wise man, on the other hand, is described in this way. Verse 15, he's prudent. Verse 16, he's one who is cautious. And verse 18, because verse 17 is dedicated entirely to wickedness and evil. In verse 18, again, he is 
prudent, showing us that connection between 15 and 18. As we just take a cursory glance at these verses before us, can we all not see the radical separation that exists between life in Christ and life without Christ? I mean, that's the continual uh, pattern and emphasis of Proverbs. What a stark difference there ought to be between the Christian and the world. And I say that's very important to us in this day and age, as it has in fact been in every day and age. Where the world has by all means crept into the church, in fact assailed large portions of the church, so that not even the church nowadays is sounding a clear uh, blast on the trumpet. Not even the church can make it clear what is right and what is wrong. And the world is pressurizing us more and more generation by generation to conform to its standards. Well, Proverbs says that's the standards of the fool, of the one who is unwise, who is not cautious, who is quick-tempered, who devises evil. It's the standards of the simple. And we, brethren, are not to be conformed to those standards because we have a greater standard to be conformed to that is Christ-likeness. And the Spirit is working presently and continuously in the Christian not to conform us to the world, but to conform us to Christ. Briefly, let's look at some of these verses. Verse 15 speaks about the simple. The simple one is, in this context, gullible. Because it says there, the simple believes everything. They accept what they are told uncritically. They accept what they are told uncritically, forgetting that every human being who has ever existed save our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom that information comes that they are told, is a sinner. Everyone who gives information to someone else is a sinner. And that information that they are told, they believe everything, is mediated through a sinful being. Every piece of information that we receive from each other is mediated through a sinful creature. And and brethren, we would do well to remember that in the church. And it's especially challenging when our friends come to us and tell us something, often about someone else, that kind of suits us to believe. The gullible believe everything. Oh, so-and-so, he's this kind of person, or she's that kind of person. And they they bring gossip or slander. And we're inclined to believe it because they're our friends. But only the simple, only the gullible believe everything. Everyone in that sense has an agenda. And it might simply be the agenda of, of pride. I have information and I can pass it on to you. We're told don't believe everything you read, certainly in the press. And I want to say to you tonight, don't believe everything that you are told because all information is mediated to you through sinful people. But the prudent, the wise, the Christian operates to a better standard. He gives thought to his steps. That is to say, he doesn't believe necessarily everything he is told. He has given that God-given gift of discernment, of considering what is being spoken to him. He's always aware of what is said in Proverbs 18, 17, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. He considers what he is told and thereby guards his own path, guards his steps. He or she stops himself going down a course of action that he shouldn't because he or she is prudent. They guard and they filter what they are told so that they guard and filter their thoughts and thus they guard and filter their actions. Why? Because we know, do we not, absolute truth exists and absolute truth is not found in any one of us natively. So are we discerning. Do we have that, in the New Covenant language, Berean spirit to test what we are told? 
Because we look at the other end of this section, verse 18, which is the parallel of verse 15, and we see the rewards, the results, the consequences of what happens to both that, those kinds of people. The simple believe everything, and they inherit folly. They inherit folly. Folly begets folly. And just as the righteous are crowned with knowledge, the fool is crowned with ignorance. The fool gets folly. It's the same language down in verse 24. But the folly of fools brings folly. The folly of fools brings folly. There's danger, there's deception in foolishness. But the prudent are crowned, we're told, verse 18, with knowledge. The prudent, as one theologian writes, the prudent inherits what he is open to. He is open to wisdom and therefore is crowned with wisdom and with knowledge. In like manner, the fool is open to folly and is crowned with that kind of ignorance. What are we? And what will we receive? Verses 16 and 17 portray for us two kinds of more situations. The wise is cautious in verse 16, and the foolish is reckless. Look at verse 16. One who is wise is cautious and turns away from evil. But a fool is reckless and careless. And by context, we can say, turns towards evil. If the wise man is turning away from evil by his caution, the fool by his recklessness and carelessness stampedes headlong into that kind of evil. Uh, some manuscripts here in verse 16 say this, One who is wise is fearful. It's unclear exactly what they're fearful of. Does it refer there to the fear of the Lord? Does it refer to a fear of evil itself and a fear of the consequences of evil? Either way, the product in their lives because of their godly caution, their godly wisdom, is that they turn away from evil. And if you're a sincere Christian here tonight, you know this, not necessarily exhaustively or not even sufficiently. But we know, do we not, the exceeding sinfulness of sin in our own lives. That's why often we flee from evil. Because we know the exceeding sinfulness of sin within our own hearts and the terrible effects it can have upon us, upon our loved ones, upon our church, and upon society. Thomas Watson says this of sin, of evil, sin has the devil for its father, shame for its companion, and death for its wages. There is sufficient grounds to flee from evil. Your father, the devil, shame for your companion, and your wages, yes, death itself. That's why the Christian fears sin, should hate sin, because we know what sin can bring in our lives. The fool, on the other hand, is reckless. They're reckless and careless. And their carelessness leads them towards sin, not away from it. Interestingly, in a world that seems to deny consequences at, at every turn of the head, this passage is full of of consequences, devastating consequences for sin. Scripture is full of devastating consequences of sin, even death itself. And recklessness and carelessness is a description of what the world about us now is like. Look at where we are. Recklessness and carelessness in so many different parts of life, in the political realm, we have politicians who make promises to us with either no intention of keeping those promises or even no ability to keep those promises. They promise what they can't deliver. That's reckless and careless. So many of us are taught through the media and otherwise that sin will grant us flourishing in our human estate. The lie that there are no consequences to our actions. 
And perhaps the apex of folly is this, that those who know the consequences of their actions and still plow ahead with those same consequences. That's the definition in Proverbs of the fool. Recklessness and carelessness that leads them directly to sin. What are we to be? Verse 17, are we to be men of quick temper and people of evil devices? Look at verse 17, a man of quick temper acts foolishly and a man of evil devices is hated. It's interesting here, the syntax in the Hebrew tells us this is an antithetical proverb like the previous two, but the actual content of it tells us that it's the same thing, that the man of quick temper is aligned with a man of evil devices. It's very unusual structure in Proverbs. The last thing the quick-tempered person gives thought to is consequences for himself and for others. Consequently, they simply give vent to their anger, and they want to get their way by throwing their weight around. That's a fool. That's a fool. They're angry people. Of course, they have no thought for other people. Ironically, they have no thought for themselves either. How the anger within them destroys them from the inside out, as well as their rage ruining others. And connected with that one of quick temper is a man of evil devices. We've heard of him before in Proverbs, the plotter, the gossiper, the slanderer, the one who speaks behind the scenes, who winks with his eye, who signals with his foot, evil devices, the one who lies in wait for blood, whether it's real blood or metaphorically. Hear this. What kind of man is he? He's hated. A man of evil devices is hated, hated by the covenant community to whom this passage is addressed. Brethren, to be or not to be, what are we to be? What are we to be like? What is our character to be? If we are those who are abiding in Christ, loving the brethren, loving God, then we'll find ourselves here with the prudent being described as the prudent. And thanks be to God for His wonderful work in Christians like us. Not that we can do it on our own account, not that we could do it on our own account, but that the Spirit takes these words, sows them into our heart, and changes us. So that in those times when we step over the mark, when we transgress or we fall short, we have a way back to God. It's not the end of the road if we've fallen into these sins as Christians. Indeed, God will take that sin and use it in your life to teach you, to teach us the ways of righteousness. I'm not sure he's mentioned in Proverbs. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But the Holy Spirit undergirds every single verse in Proverbs. Proverbs is not just Christological, Christ-centered. It's Trinitarian. Here is your Father in heaven speaking to you, my son, my daughter. It speaks of Christ, the, the righteous one, and it speaks of the Spirit sanctifying the Christian, that ongoing work in your life, changed, transformed, piece by piece, slowly but surely. Here is Christ-likeness defined. Here it is to abide in God. Here it is to love the brethren. Here it is to be marked out as a child of God. And brethren, you are light. Because you are like this, you are light. And what association does light have with darkness? This is for all of us, not just the young people, who are perhaps more saturated and, 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 and more prone to the, the troubles of media and the modern world. It's for all of us. What association do we have with darkness, ultimately? And we have associations, of course, by virtue of our, our labor, by virtue of our neighbors, by virtue of our family. But in terms of friendship 
and likeness. To be close to the world is to be like the world. To be like the world will ultimately suffer the end of the world. The simple inherit folly. But the Spirit is doing more remarkable things in the child of God because the prudent are crowned with knowledge. Knowledge of Christ the Lord. Knowledge of Christ the Savior. Knowledge of the promises of God which keep us near to our Lord as we understand them. The end for the wise is far more glorious than the end of the fool. And to have Christ is to have far greater treasures than the world can ever offer us. That's our character. That's our end. But character we know in Scripture produces conduct. Verses 18 to verse 24. Conduct and, in no small measure, consequence. Again, as I mentioned earlier, verses 18 and verse 24 form what's called an inclusio or bookends. They replicate each other in theme and in language, telling us this is another subsection of Proverbs. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge, verse 18. Verse 24, the crown of the wise is their wealth, but the folly of fools brings folly. What does the wise man get? What does the fool get? Verses 18 and verses 24. Folly, we said earlier, begets folly. Why is that? Why is it? Uh, Folly, we understand here, uh, is the opposite of wisdom. It's the opposite of the life of faith. Uh, It's the opposite of the fear of of the Lord. Why do we say then that folly begets folly? Well, partly because the text tells us that the folly of fools brings folly. But how do we see that played out for us, verses 18 and 24, in the rest of Scripture, in Proverbs, and in life before us? Why does folly beget folly? First of all, because folly or sin is self affirming. Folly is self affirming. Folly seeks to normalize sin and even to encourage sin. At least that's what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1, 32. Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. I mean, we said earlier that's the pinnacle of folly, isn't it? Knowing God's decree and punishment, they continue to do it. But our point here is that folly is self-affirming. They do not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. That's why folly begets folly. But folly is also self-protecting. Verses 7 to 11. And I don't mean protects the one in sin. Sin protects sin. It keeps it going under whatever pretense it can. It provides a reason for sin. It provides a justification for sin. Even, as we see in Proverbs, dressing sin up in religious language and religious behavior. The adulterous woman of Proverbs 7.11. She is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market. And at every corner she lies in wait. She seizes him, that's the simple one, and kisses him and with bold face says to him, I had to offer sacrifices today, and I have paid my vows, so now I have come out to meet you. It protects itself by justifying itself, even, as we see in Proverbs, through religious language and religious practice. It's okay to do what we're about to do, because I've paid my dues to God today. Folly is also self-promoting. Again, remember a woman folly in Proverbs chapter 9. Woman folly becomes an evangelist for adultery. Give that a thought for a moment. Chapter 9 verse 13, it's self-promoting. Woman folly is loud. She is seductive and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat on the highest place of the town, calling to those who pass by, who are going straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. 
advertising, evangelizing for her own deathly ends. But folly does not provide with blessedness. It is actually self-consuming. It consumes the individual in question. Proverbs 4, verse 14, Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it, do not go on it. Turn away from it and pass on, for they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they have made someone stumble. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. It's self-consuming to the point that it makes the individual unable to sleep, as it were, unless they've done something wicked. It speaks of violence as their bread and their butter, as it were. But folly is also self uh, self-deafening. It is self-deafening. It makes you impervious to criticism or counsel. Proverbs 9, 7, whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse, and whoever reproves a wicked man incurs injury. And because you cannot hear or the fool cannot hear, their ultimate end is to walk the path which seems right to them, but its way is the way of death. Folly is finally self-destructive. Chapter 5, verse 21. For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him. And he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline. And because of his great folly, he is led astray. Children, that's sin for you. Young people, that's sin for you. It's the devil's lifelong work to get you, a child of the covenant of Almighty God, to end up like that. That's Satan's design for you tonight. You must know that. If you take one lesson from this series, this long series on Proverbs, take this. Don't be a fool. Don't be the fool of Proverbs. So what is life like? What are the consequences? What is the conduct of the unrighteous in these verses? Very briefly, verse 19, first of all, for those who give themselves to wickedness, they will find themselves bowing down to the children of God. Verse 19, the evil bow down before the good and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. It's an interesting proverb, isn't it? Because you think, oh, not so much. doesn't frequently happen this. We certainly don't see it much in our own age, do we? The wicked bowing down before the good. And you're thinking, well, it doesn't happen very often. And you're right, which speaks to us about the nature of Proverbs in the first place. They're not cast iron guarantees for this life, but they do speak to us of guarantees for the life to come. That's not to say it doesn't happen in this life. It is, in a sense, to the praise of God when, when the wicked are brought and held to account for their sin. It is, if we can put it this way, a demonstration and even a celebration of the righteousness of God. Uh, the psalmists thought so. They wrote entire psalms about the wicked being cast down and the righteous being vindicated. But Proverbs is very clear Uh, especially in the Hebrew, in the ESV in verse 19, has done a really good job of conveying the reality of this proverb. Uh, In the ESV, it's the present tense, the evil bow down before the good. In the Hebrew, it could even be translated as a past tense. They have bowed down. The proverb is saying, look, this is something that has already happened. So certain is the guarantee that the wicked will be thrown down and the righteous elevated. This is now in the past tense. 
And yet we don't see it always in time, do we? Frequently in time, the unrighteous escape. They're elevated in society. They die in peace. They have plenty. But the book of Revelation points to us as to another reality. In Revelation chapter 3, uh, the letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. In verse 7, we read this. Uh, verse 9, actually. We'll go to there. Behold... I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Now, we need to understand that peculiarly in the context of Revelation, most certainly. But is that not also the picture throughout the book of Revelation? The vindication of the righteous, the children of God the glorification of the righteous, the children of God, the, the crowning and inauguration of the righteous and the children of God, crowned with glory, ruling with Christ forever. By definition, the wicked will bow down eternally before the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a picture here of total vindication. And bear in mind, some of our brethren are lying in prisons tonight, right now, for their love of Christ. There'll come a time when their jailers bow down before them. It might not happen till Christ comes again. Oh, but assuredly it will happen. That's the end of the evil and the wicked. Verse 20 provides us with another consequence or reality of life. The poor is disliked even by his neighbor, but the rich has many friends. It's one of the first of a few proverbs here which speak about the poor and the wealthy. It's a hard proverb. There's a number of interpretations out there. I take it to mean this. The poor here is simply it's hated by his neighbor, while the rich has many supposed friends. And yet we need to note this very important fact in Proverbs. Uh, while the poor in Proverbs, and by that I mean the term the poor in Proverbs, not those who have by their own indolence or laziness become poor, Proverbs speaks of them as well, but the poor as an idea, a concept, though they may be financially deficient in Proverbs, are never portrayed as morally deficient. They may be financially deficient, but they're never portrayed as morally deficient. I read that in the commentator. I went and checked every use of the term the poor in Proverbs, and I believe it's correct. Yes, there are those who become poor by their lack of studious living. Indeed, uh, we'll read that in verse 23. But the poor here are not those who are immoral. So what does the proverb mean in its context? Well, I think this is what it means. The rich has many friends. Why? Because they're rich. Which means their many friends are not real friends. They're the kind of people that the world wants to be around because of what they can gain from them by association. When that rich falls on hard times, that rich man falls on hard times, where are those friends? They're gone. So there's a sense in which it's better to be despised for being poor than to have a myriad of supposed friends who desert you in your hour of need. We've seen that concept before in Proverbs in just the previous chapters, verse 12, uh, chapter 12, sorry. This is life in uh, and subject to the natural or the conduct of the natural man. Subject to fleeting praise, subject to fleeting friendship, and then subject to their censure when you're not quite such hot property. You see, there's a warning against that kind of behavior, that favoritism, uh, that, that, that looking to see what you can get out of people in the very next verse. Verse 21. Whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. To despise your neighbor is to be a sinner. 
plain and simple. Despise is a strong word. To despise your neighbor is, is never to give them a good thought. It's to continually think ill or evil of them. They may be your enemy, but to despise them is improper because even we were God's enemies at one point and he did not despise us. Verse 22, I think, is a summary proverb of this whole section. It's a question, do they not go astray who devise evil? Those who devise good meet steadfast love and faithfulness. We've seen this common theme many, many times over. The consequence of evil doing is further evil doing. To give oneself to evil is to continually walk down the path of evil until greater evil comes. It is to go astray or to be led astray so that the individual is confirmed as it were in greater and greater and greater sin. To the point where we go back to verse 9, fools mock at the guilt offering. At the idea that, that I owe God anything, that's a hardened mind. The idea that I owe God something, that he has provided an answer to that in a, in a sacrifice. Don't be stupid, the world says. Reference Richard Dawkins uh, last week on that very matter. Folly begets folly. Do they not go astray who devise evil? Same kind of language as verse 17b. A man of evil devices is hated. What a different consequence, though, for the one who devises good. Those who devise good meet steadfast love and faithfulness. We tend to think of that word devise having negative connotations, but here it's positive. The planning of good, as it were, the plotting of good, the devising of good works, purposefully and intentionally seeking the good of your neighbor, the good of your church, the good of your family, even, we might say, the good of your society. Thoughtful about it. Careful consideration. How may I assist? How may I bear a burden in this way? Such a one inherits steadfast love and faithfulness. Brethren, that's the language of covenant. You'd be amazed at how many theologians say the language of covenant is not found in Proverbs. Rubbish! You read the Psalms and what do we find out about God? That he has steadfast love towards his children and that he is enduringly faithful. This means God's blessing lies on those who plot the good of their brethren. And we ought not be surprised by that. It's an incentive for each one of us here today to be busy bees in the kingdom of Christ. How can we serve? How can we strengthen? How can we lift up the hands and the arms of those who are struggling? Well, one incentive is this, that the steadfast love and faithfulness of Almighty God will meet you. And you'll know His care. You'll know His protection. You'll know His love day after day after day. Verse 23 is a proverb on work. We've seen it before. It's put slightly differently here. It contrasts the studious with the talker. The studious with the talker. In all toil there is profit. It doesn't tell us what kind of toil, but it does tell us there is profit. But mere talk tends only to poverty. It's a principle not just for paid labor, but for every kind of work. Every kind of work that you find yourself in, whether it's your employer, whether it's in your family, whether it's in this church, uh, in your neighborhoods, and so on. Where there is toil, where there is work, where there is labor, where there is conscientiousness, there is, we read, uh, profit. Profit. Good. The blessing of God is upon the one who works hard. Contrasted with that, the one who spends all their time talking about doing produces little. 
Talk tends to poverty. Toil tends to profit and blessing and wealth. So we can think about that in our church life, in every aspect, how we can be those, and we're all at different seasons of life and not everyone can contribute in the same way to the same extent. But how can we contribute to this church or to our families and beyond? And verse 24, which we've already spoken of before, closes this short section of Proverbs. The crown of the wise is their wealth. And that surely can't just be understood in terms of finances. Surely there is also a spiritual wealth, a spiritual inheritance that is passed on from generation to generation to generation. The crown of the wise is their wealth, but the folly of fools brings folly. So we are building more and more. Proverbs is building more and more. We're going to take a break from Proverbs in a week or two. But Proverbs is, is building more and more this picture of the child of God. The character and the conduct of the child of God. And there might be one proverb which speaks to you more than other proverbs. God is calling us here tonight to consider who we are and what we are to do. Who we are and what we are to do. And in short, the answer is this. We are children of the King. We're children of the King. So let's be about the King's work. Amen. Almighty God, we do pray that your blessing will indeed rest upon this word divided tonight. Forgive the failings of me, the preacher, and Lord God, bless mightily the word in our hearts. Speak to us, almighty God, that we might go out from this place serving you well. If we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.